Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar about how to program a show for a festival rig presented by Lauren Siegel. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. Uh, just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down the noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit questions to the presenter and we'll consolidate them and answer those at the end. Uh, this webinar will also be recorded. The link will be made available a few days after this presentation. And we do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com. And you can also visit Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to Lauren Sego, the presenter for today's webinar. While studying theater lighting design at CalArts, Lauren began her career operating eSports streams. Since graduating in 2016, she's provided lighting design and programming for music tours, festivals, and TV appearances by Janelle Monet, Tegan and Sarah, Revolution, and others. And now I'm gonna pass the mic over to you, Lauren. Well, thank you, Laura. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope you're all staying healthy and safe. I um, just want to say thank you to Martin Harmon for having me, um, and a huge thank you to my friends at Aspect Lighting who let me a console to get things ready for the presentation. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to talk for about 40, 45 minutes to try to leave some room for questions. So class information, I kind of designed this webinar for the beginner to intermediate programmer. Um, I wanted to create an environment to teach from because it's kind of a, a broad subject to talk about. Um, so I want us to all pretend that we're programming a tour that's only traveling with the ground package. Uh, and you want to program some supplemental flown lighting for whenever your act travels through festivals. Maybe you don't want to clone your programming from your ground package to the festival or you want to have um, its own supplemental um, addition to your show. Uh, and this show is going to be a cued show, not a punted show. Um, so these are three major questions I ask myself before I begin the programming process. Uh, first one is most important. Um, ask your artist or creative team about their festival lighting desires. Uh, when you're in rehearsals, if you just have a ground package, uh, your artist and your creative, uh, your creative team, they're obviously going to be seeing the, the process of your programming with the ground package, but they're probably not going to be able to um, to imagine the festival rig that's going to be above them when they perform. So um, before you begin anything, it's kind of nice to get an understanding of what they expect from you. Maybe they don't like heavy backlight. Maybe they don't like a lot of distractions above them, or maybe they just don't care and they just want you to do whatever you want. Um, I've worked with lots of artists that are very, very specific about what they want. They'll sit next to me. We'll, we'll go through every single detail, nitpick all the way down, um, or they're just like, you're the creative reins, I've hired you, have fun. Um, you're going to come across a lot of different artists throughout your career, so just kind of get used to this always changing. Um, and you're going to be programming a very, uh, a very basic festival rig with me today. Um, obviously, your festival rigs are going to be, um, you're going to be traveling through, are going to be different every time. So if there is something specific that the artist is looking for and you go to a festival and you look at the rig and you're thinking, oh crap, I can't make this happen, um, make sure you communicate that beforehand. Uh, so even if you were just hired to be the touring LD, um, the, the um, lighting director, uh, so you're not designing a tour, maybe you're not even programming most of the tour, that's all another, um, another department, another team, and you're just going out to operate it and execute it every day, you're still a part of the creative process whether you realize it or not because once that show is in your hands and you're on the road, you're responsible for talking to your artists and making changes and listening to them to make sure that you can bring the show that they want. Um, this next question is more of a, a time utilization tool that I use, um, especially if you're just starting out programming tours. Um, it can be really daunting. The first few songs you program can be super daunting. You have all these ideas, you don't know where to begin. Um, that's where most of your energy lies, I think. Um, and so I try to program the most important parts of the show first, put most of my energy at the top, um, at the top of my programming session. So I, you know, if rehearsals get cut short or whatever, I made sure that the most important songs can get programmed. And those could be, I usually start with like top of the show and then I'll do the encore or vice versa. 
then I move to the important songs in the middle, then I go down the list. Um, and this last question, are you going to be using your ground package at the festivals? Um, yes or no, really, that's, you know, it's a 50-50 chance, but um, it's a great way to keep uniqueness uh, in your show if you do want to use your ground package at festivals, but it's not always feasible, which brings me to the next slide where we can go over three potential situations to consider. So maybe you are able to use your ground package at every festival. Maybe you and your team have logistically figured out, yes, we can make sure the ground package can get loaded in and we can use it. Um, so then maybe you want to think creatively about programming your festival rig as more of a supplemental um, show to your ground package instead of a bulk of the programming. Or maybe you're unable to use the ground package at every festival, therefore your festival rig programming needs to be the bulk of the show. Um, and of course, that can be a mixture of cloning some of your ground package to the festival rig if you want to keep some cool stuff, or you can just uh, reprogram it separately and entirely. Um, or it's going to be a mix. Sometimes you'll have the ground package, sometimes you won't. That's just up to you to make creative decisions on how you want to program the festival rig. Um, but regardless of these situations, my suggestion is to program the festival rig as if you're never going to have a ground package, no matter how big or small your tour is. Um, that's only because things like bad weather can happen, um, late trucks, you know, maybe your truck never arrives, something goes wrong. Um, you might not have the time or resources to use your own gear, so you don't want to have uh, a ground package program and maybe just a little bit of extra fun stuff in the rig and then it comes time for changeover and you can't get your rig up. And then you kind of, you you know, suddenly you're having to adapt really fast to what can work. And this is, you know, trust me, good practice. I've had to do this plenty of times, but I've always felt more comfortable knowing I have more to work with than less. Um, so when you sit down to program, uh, a good starting point in preparing your show file, especially if it's a huge show, uh, I'm going to talk to you about the benefit of the song per page or song macro method that I and a lot of my friends use. Um, so unlike punted show files, you know, where there's just kind of like a page of everything, um, I use this method. I also don't punt very often. I don't, I don't like it as much as queuing. I, I prefer to queue my shows. Um, I use macros to fire different songs. Um, and really all the macro is doing is um, selecting and getting a certain sequence ready because all my songs are separate sequences. They're not just, you know, song after song in one cue list. Um, they're separate sequences. It fires different views. So I have a different, um, a different view of my effects tool for every song. So when I go to that song, the effects window that pops up only shows me the effects for that song. Um, and then same thing with, you know, a few other preset tools or whatever and some notes and, and things like that. It just makes it easier for me to see what I'm using because if I have a page of effects that's just all the effects I've used in my show and I want to go edit a song, I have to go look and see, unless, I'm, unless I organize it in a way that works for me, I have to go find which effect is running and edit it from there. Um, and you'll also notice that my macros are different colors, and this is just, this is an example. I, I started doing this a couple years ago, and it's really helped me. I call it my traffic light method. Um, so as I'm programming, uh, if I haven't programmed the song at all, they all start red, as in I haven't touched them. If I've made progress on a song, I make it yellow, and then if I have completed the song top to bottom, I turn it green. Um, and this is an appearance feature on the MA. I'm an MA programmer, by the way. Um, first and foremost, I'll try to speak broadly, as broadly as I can, but most of my examples would be MA-based. Um, but this is just a really good way for me to see my progress. And, you know, the further you get along, the further and quicker you want to work, at least with me. Um, so just like I, how I have a different view per effects, we'll just use effects as an example, um, a different view with my effects pool per song, I also Divvy mine up so like the top half of that window for that song um, it, are effects I wrote for my ground package and the bottom half uh, are the effects I wrote for the festival. So it's even easier for me if I'm going to a festival, I go to that song, I'm looking at a, an effect I wrote for the rig, I know exactly where it is going to be on that page. Um, so my festival rig that I have in my file are all Martin products. Um, I like to use Viper profiles for my spots and my beams. Um, 
because it's kind of your, it's one of my favorite lights. Um, it's got a lot of different attributes to it that are fantastic. Um, it's a lot easier, and we'll talk about cloning in a little bit, but it's a lot easier to pick a light that has a lot to choose from, but it's easier to dial back if you're cloning to a different light that has you know, maybe less to offer than adding it and then having to replace and reprogram and, and do things like that. Um, so the Viper's great, you know, it's got CTO, it's got Frost, it's got great zoom, color mixing. Um, and the only reason I use it for my spots and my beams in my profile, even though they're not a beam fixture, is just for continuity's sake, um, just to, you know, have one less fixture profile to clone from. Um, the only difference I have when I'm programming it as a beam I use the color wheel because more often than not, the beams you're going to come across in festival rigs are only going to have color wheels. Um, for my wash light, I use Macoras because they're, you know, it's a standard fixture profile. It's just, it has the bones of your perfect wash light. Super easy to clone from. Um, and same with the Atomic 3K LED. Um, there are just lots of LED strobes on the market right now, and I've been finding a lot more showing up in festival rigs. And kind of like the Aura, this is kind of more of a straightforward um, LED strobe picture to clone from, so a little bit easier on that front than most of the other like multi-instance ones. Um, so when it comes time to designing the festival rig in your show, um, obviously you're not going to have it with you in rehearsals. You're going to have to build a 3D file of a festival rig to watch alongside your programming for your ground package. Um, mine is super broad. Like it's a super basic um, four truss, technically six truss um, um, festival rig. I have decided over the years that uh, two rows of each fixture type and uh, 12 of each is really easy to, um, to take, uh, to like size down and to size up. Uh, I just, you know, a lot of festival rigs will have anywhere between like eight on average if it's a smaller stage. So it's way easier to dial back. And sometimes we'll have 24. So I found 12 is good because then I can size up. And I I tour with so many different bands and so many different festivals. Sometimes I'll have like four spots. Sometimes I'll have 60, really depends. Um, so I have two rows of 12 spots each, two rows of 12 beams, two rows of 12 washes, and two rows of 12 strobes. I have, uh, I also have a row of front lights, uh, so 12 more Vipers, 12 Vipers, and another row of 12 four light blinders. Um, I recently switched over, instead of just using um, single channel dimmers as my blinders, I started using generic RGB LEDs instead of the dimmers. And I started doing that because a lot of festivals I've been to in the past year uh, with one of the reggae bands I work for has had a lot of those. So I thought I might as well just change it over to RGB LED, you can't go wrong. You know, if you have some time to add some color choices to your blinders, go ahead. Um, but again, festival rigs will never be consistent. You know, this is a very broad and basic design that I've been using and still and have still been adapting over the course of a few years. Um, but I've never come across a festival rig that has exactly what I have in my file. Still waiting on that. Um, you have to kind of just get used to being uncomfortable uh, and just knowing what you're going to have to constantly adapt depending on what you have that day. So again, very, very basic image of my example just to show you more of the layout rather than the programming. Um, so starting from the top, you can see the RGB blinders. Below that is my row front light, which is not on. Then I have my rows of my spots and washes and strobes and beams and everything. And then in the second picture, you can also see at the bottom, there's another row that's not on. I do have a backlight row also. Um, I used to program backlight as a part of my spot to my festival rig, but I realized very quickly that's time consuming when updating uh, backlight position. So I do have an extra row of vipers in the back there just for backlight and I'll still program it into the show, but I'll only clone it and use it if I have enough spots to make my show seem filled enough and still be able to accomplish a good backlight look. Um, so my general approach to actually programming the festival rig is a less is more approach. Um, I don't want to say you have to feel confined to simplicity, but it will make you feel a lot more relaxed. Um, 
the less intricacies in your programming, the less time you're spending trying to recreate complicated looks and more time dialing in other elements that are maybe a little bit more important. Um, if you do have looks in your show that you need to be very specific and are very intricate, just prioritize those and find a way, uh, at least either in your show file or just, you know, just some sort of method in your head to get used to adjusting that every day. You know, if you have a really intricate look um, or, you know, position, a relative position for your foreign effect or something, um, just spend time and think about how you have to um, adjust that every day because you're probably not going to have a lot of time. Um, even if you are given an overnight programming slot or a previous tent slot so you feel really comfortable in coming in with your, like, 45 really crazy looking positions, that's cool but those could get taken away from you in a second. Um, you never know what's gonna happen. I've definitely showed up to festivals expecting like two hours of programming time before um, gates opened. And you know, I, then I also had my 30 minute change over, so I felt comfortable like, oh, two and a half hours, plenty of time. And then of course something happens and I only have the change over. So you really just have to be prepared to be able to update everything as quickly as possible. And that's why broader strokes are ensuring that your adaptation to the festival will be much more efficient. Um, also, because there could be drastic changes between the show file rig and the festival rig, like I will say 8 million times in this presentation. Um, so things to consider, uh, uh, like I was saying earlier, you might have programmed 24 spots in your festival rig, but you show up and there's only eight, or maybe you program 24 beams and you show up and there's 68. Um, you know, there's or there's no strobes or two strobes or no spots at all in all beams. You know, there's so many different options. So kind of have to think about how you want to clone or use your festival programming in the rig. Um, just practice playback of your show in different scenarios. Um, maybe even patch other fixtures and just kind of see what it would look like if you clone to these. Of course, you know, 3D isn't always going to be exactly what it's like in real life, but I can at least have you picture what it might be like should you show up to a very weird rig. All right, so next are preset tips. So when you're programming your show, um, try to reduce the amount of presets you have to update again, because you might only have that 30 minute changeover. Um, so first things first, position presets, super time consuming. I program only about eight to 10 max for my show. Um, and remember that when you show up to the festival rig, the lights could be hung different ways, you know, hung backwards sideways, the trusses could be angled all weird, so you might have a lot of time nitpicking with your positions, and that could reduce a lot of the time you have to update everything. Um, color presets, I only use a handful of color presets for my spots, washes, and strobes, and then color wheel presets only for my beams. Um, I usually, I used to use um, just a bunch of global presets for all my colors, but I started to differentiate the color presets for my ground package, which I would, you know, kind of just go crazy with that because that's at least going to be consistent. But I would kind of dumb it down with my festival rig because a red you might program in your um, in your festival rig might not be the best red that's actually in the in real life festival rig. Uh, zoom presets, I just do a narrow, mid, and wide option. Um, a lot easier than trying to adjust, you know, about ten different zoom presets. Gobo presets, uh, my source ones are also just very generic. I use dots, um, cones, breakups, uh, linear ones, stuff like that, like maybe four or five Gobos. And, um, and that way it's just a lot easier to actually see what I'm trying to accomplish. And I can take the newer, uh, or the, the festival rig that's in front of me above the stage and say like, okay, that's a job Gobo, I'll just, I'll restore that one. Um, and then, you know, there's obviously other presets that you can practice these reduction techniques with to see what works for you. So cloning is how you are going to get your programming from your show file festival rig to the festival rig at the venue. Um, I think I mentioned that it's kind of a scary thing when you're just starting out, but I promise you it's not scary. It's your friend. Um, just practice it a bunch. Practice a mock festival day. Patch a different rig, you know, maybe patch some quantums instead of your vipers, and then try cloning from fixture type to fixture type. Uh, the more that you practice it, the more comfortable you'll get understanding how it actually works. And you can see the changes in 3D. 
Um, so with cloning, there is a lot of importance from source to destination. That's what cloning is doing. You're cloning the information from the source fixtures, so the one in your show file, to the destination fixtures, which are the festival fixtures. Um, at least in the MA, there is a cloning GUI in the setup window. I choose to not use it because uh, I'm more visual <laughs> than that. Uh, I don't really work well with uh, more list-based GUIs. Um, so I've built a cloning page in my show file just to help me visualize and see and go down the line and see exactly what I've cloned so far. Um, so I'll kind of explain this picture that's going on. All it's doing, um, all it's showing are the columns I have on my cloning page where I have stored uh, on one side my groups, my source groups, my spots, my beams, my washes. And of course, these might change um, depending on how you want to clone. Maybe you want to clone trust by trust. I don't know. It's up to you. I always clone by fixture. Um, all the macro is doing in the middle is just cloning that to whatever the group is on the right. And those groups I have to store once I get to the festival. So, uh, but also keep in mind, you know, if you have 24 source spots in your, um, in your show file, and maybe there's only 20 in the festival rig, um, just think about how you want to clone it to. Maybe you just take off one on each end for each truss. Um, but you're going to have to restore your source group. So remember to not clone 24 spots in your show file to 20 spots in the festival rig. It won't work the way you want it to. So you will have to restore your source and then also store your destination. Um, so as I do that with the festival rig, I can just label and kind of see exactly what I'm going to be cloning. And that way I can kind of go down the line one by one and just check really quick. So it's a little bit easier for me to visualize. It's personal preference, but you know, do whatever works for you. Um, I do the same thing for all presets in my show. Um, so as, as far as like a color, um, maybe Gobo, I don't, I don't necessarily have um, a, a specific place where I store and possibly have to replace it, but I do with my all presets. Um, a good example are, you know, we talked about intricate looks earlier that you have to have no matter what. Uh, and a good example for me is Starry Night. Um, I have a band I work for that, for one song, loves to have pretty much every single light off except the spots, and they like it to blanket the stage, the sides of the stage, the back of the stage, the, the deck, all of them, in like dotted gobos with the prism, wide zoom, sharp focus to kind of look like a blanket of stars. Um, and instead of having four different presets for that look, I have an all preset for it. Um, and I keep that in a special place in the console where I can just update that one preset as I go. And after I clone, maybe the fixtures I've cloned to can't really, uh, can't really accomplish that look as well. So I kind of have to replace that preset essentially for that song, for, that, for any of those keys in that song. So I have a special place for my all presets, and I have a very, very similar window where um, it's the source preset, and then a macro, instead of cloning it, it replaces it in that sequence with a new preset that I might have to store on the destination side. So just for, gro just for groups and a few presets are, are when I have this like source to destination column look. Um, so you program to show, and it's time to go to the festival. Uh, so very, 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 very important questions to ask for arriving at least a week before arriving to the festival. Um, am I able to get a festival patch, plots, and any associated paperwork and information? Hopefully you do. Um, is there overnight or daytime programming available? Uh, it's not as common to get overnight or daytime programming available if your slots at like 2 or 3 p.m., but it's always worth asking. Um, is there a previous tent on site? Uh, most festivals will have a tent or a container. Uh, with some consoles in it where you can go and just use uh, uh, use it as a previous station for some amount of slots, you know, the day before or the day of to check your programming. Um, how long is my changeover? Very, very important because, again, sometimes you might be offered uh, any some daytime programming or a previous 10 slot and it could be taken away. So I kind of like to come to a festival as prepared as I can to just have a changeover. Um, and also, is my festival LD available to meet before my programming session to discuss changes? Um, don't be afraid to talk to them. They're there to help you. Um, they're obviously there to help a lot of other people too. Um, but just don't, you know, don't be afraid to approach them. There, 95% of the time, there are changes that you have to discuss. 
And the sooner you can talk about it, the better. Um, and that is a good question to travel into uh, this tip that I have learned to do over the years. I come prepared with two show files to festivals. Uh, I come to the festival with a file with the festival rig fully patched. Um, it's a really, really good starting point. You're probably still going to have to make some changes. You know, it's rare that you show up and the patch they gave you three days before is the same. But it's still a really good starting point and it reduces some time on the console for you to actually get to cloning and updating your loads. Um, I also come with a version of the festival rig patched and cloned. This has only happened to me one time where the festival patch did not change, nothing changed, the positions were all the same. I had already come with the show patch and I had cloned it. I hadn't updated any presets or anything yet, but I at least come with it cloned. And it was super helpful. I mean, it, it took like 20 minutes off of my day. Um, and just as a, a tip for people who have not gone through a lot of festivals, remember that when you're updating your rig after you've cloned, to only update the festival rig. Don't also grab your source rig, because that'll screw up future cloning situations. Um, this is a weird one. So programming the unusual fixtures. And by this, I mean, maybe there are some fixtures in the rig that are giant multi-instance wash lights. Um, sorry, I have to remove another annotation request again. <laughs> um, it blocks my screen, so I have to exit. Um, so maybe you have a bunch of giant wash lights in the rig that are like 100 something channels, all multi-instance. Or, you know, you have a ton of multi-instance strobes in the rig that are like 60 to 70 channels, whatever. Um, you just have a lot of these weird lights that maybe you've never seen before and you don't really know where to begin. It's happened to me plenty of times. Um, so I have empty cues and buttons stored in a special place in my show file uh, where I can just quickly store information into them. Um, so maybe I don't have any prisms programmed into my festival rig in my show file, but the festival rig here at the venue has amazing an amazing prism in it. So I want to use it. So I'll just store a prism preset and I'll put that into my empty queue. Um, my cues and my buttons are all labeled very generic. Uh, you know, very generic. I have one that's prism. I have one that's beam shaper. I have one that's like strobe effects or whatever. Um, and I have like two or three cues that I can I can bump through for each one. And they're completely empty. And no matter what song I'm on, I have them fixed to a page where they're always available to look at. And that way it's a lot easier. If you know you want to put a prism in a song, uh, you don't have to go to that song and then store it, you know, cue by cue or whatever you need to do. You can just have it readily available to toggle on and off as you wish. So that also reduces a lot of time. Um, Yep, I think I've got everything in that slide. Uh, and this is the last slide. Uh, super important, cleaning your show file after the festival. Um, so you're obviously going to want to remove most of the information before continuing to the next one, just, you know, to save file space, but, you know, also to save your 3D. Um, but what I do is I create a copy of the fixture type that I used in my file and I put it into a layer called my fixture garden uh, in my patch. So I basically just keep a copy of every fixture type I've used, and that way I can still keep that fixture type information in my show file, but I can still delete a bulk of the festival patch. Um, so for example, you know, if I had quantums in my rig, and I was lucky enough to get some overnight programming time, uh, and I dialed in some really good, you know, I updated a lot of the presets that I had used, I dialed it in, I got my colors right, really loved it. Um, if you deleted all of those fixtures and then saved your file, you wouldn't, if the next time you patched the quantum in, you would lose a lot of that, of that um, preset information. So you, I always try to keep at least one in the file uh, to keep all that information there. So by chance you come across another festival in a month from now and they also have quantums in the same mode, you can just reuse that fixture profile and all of your presets will stay the same. Um, so always remember too, when you're going to, from festival to festival, continue to clone from your original source fixtures. Don't clone to quantums and then the next festival 
you have a different spot, you clone from the quantums to there. You don't want to do that. You always want to clone from the source ones in your profile. And that's it. <laughs> I tried to uh, tried to fit as much as I could into a short amount of time. I know we had some, uh, you know, some issues here and there, so I won't talk too much. But I just want to say thank you, and please reach out with questions anytime you have any. Okay, we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is asking if you can explain what a ground package is, is that's not a term that they um, use in India. Got it, oh, okay, so ground package just means uh, a lighting design package that is just built from the ground up or just sits on the ground. So maybe you don't have, um, maybe you don't have the budget to fly trusses on chain motors and have stuff uh, hanging in the air for your show. Maybe you're only able to travel with like six spots sitting on the ground or some chest towers on bases or whatever. So it just means a lighting deck package or ground package that sits on the deck. A lot easier to load in every day. You don't have to worry about hanging anything. Um, yeah, usually that's for um, beginner to intermediate tours. You'll find them in club tours, theater tours, that kind of environment. Okay, the next question is also about the ground package. It's asking if you could explain how detailed the ground package should or can be. That is totally up to you. I mean, I I just know the first thing I do when I have a ground package and I'm starting to program is I assess how much time I have. Um, usually I've done a lot of planning and note taking ahead of time to kind of get an idea of what I want to program for song. Um, I've had rehearsals that have lasted three weeks for a ground package that only had 24 lights. So I had plenty of time to get super intricate and do pretty much whatever I wanted. And also I had tons of time to do my festival rig as well. Um, but I've also had situations where I've had about like 40 to 46 lights in my ground package and only five days to program. So you kind of just really have to assess your time, your resources, um, plan ahead, but that's completely up to you. Um, but also, if you are thinking you want to try to use that programming for festival, your festival rig as well, like maybe you do want to clone your ground package to the festival, that's where you kind of have to get creative and think, okay, how intricate do I want to get? How, how advanced do I want to get with this? But that is entirely up to you and how creative you want to be. Okay, the next question is asking, what is the role of blinders and why would you use them? So blinders are really their main goal is to light the crowd, right? So uh, like I said, I use RGB LED blinders in my profile. Most of the time when you go to a festival rig or any venue, the blinders are just going to be single cell dimmers. And they're the lights that shine into the crowd. Um, I have a lot of artists that like me using them every time they talk to the crowd. And I have some artists where they don't want them on at all because they don't, they get really scared if they can see the people staring at them. So um, blinders are a lot more important than you think they are to your artist, so make sure to talk about that with them. Um, but I also use them for bumps and hits and fun stuff. You know, it doesn't have to be just to light the crowd if they're talking. You know, if I have a huge moment that I want to, I want to just hit people in the soul real hard. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll slowly bring them in and pulse them or something. You know, they have a lot. You know, they're maybe a simple fixture, but they have a lot of different uses. All right. The next question is asking if you can clarify what the difference is between getting hired as a touring LD, a touring program, or touring programmer, a festival LD, or an operator. Sure. So uh, you can sometimes be one of those things, two of those things, or all of those things, depending on the gig. Um, but the difference is the designer is the person who, who drafts the show, who designs the show, um, who's designing where the lights go, right? The programmer is the person sitting at the desk programming the show, and they might be sitting with the designer or sitting with the creative team and making it happen, or they might have just been hired to, you know, take the rig that someone else designed and put their own touch on it creatively and program the show. The touring director or operator is in charge of running the show um, and sometimes even building the rig every single day. So the director is always operating. Um, and a festival LD is the person that's at the festival who um, is usually there for load-in to situate to make sure that everything's getting built correctly. They have a starter file for you there available with patch information, and they have a file to operate bands that might not have an LD that are playing on that stage. So festival LDs are just basically 
you know, the fairy godmothers of that festival stage for the weekend to make sure that you as a guest LD coming into the stage is situated to run your show. Um, I've done tours where I've designed, programmed, and operated the rig, and I've done tours where I've just programmed, uh, just designed. Uh, you know, there's always a mixture, but usually the hiring process with your artists and their management is kind of how you get to plan your, uh, plan your fate on that one. Okay, the next question is asking about the cloning color wheel fixture to the color mix fixture. What's the best method? So I like to, if it, if, so let's say that if the destination fixture only has color mixing, it's actually quite easy. Then you just have to update and potentially replace the, the, color, the, the color wheel presets with color mixing information, which is totally fine. If you update a preset uh, with your festival rig color information, it, whatever other fixtures you have stored in that preset are not going to get affected. So, a lot easier than you think it is. All right, the next question is a multi-parter. Um, I usually clone trust to trust since a lot of festivals don't have consistent, consistent fixture quantities on each trust. Like say the DS has 12, the MS has 10, the US has eight, or sometimes even weirder. Can you explain how you would clone then by fixture type? Sure. Um, so I, well, first, I always clone in, uh, from in to out, uh, or if you have a situation like that where it's three trusses, sometimes I'll clone my downstage to my downstage, my upstage to my midstage, and then my downstage again. Um, that's just personal preference. It's also, you know, it, it really depends on how I program the show. Um, oh, was that you? Oh, sorry, I heard something. Um, uh, it really just depends on how I program the show. Um, I have to pay attention, you know, if a lot of my, at least my position looks are backlight related or not, then it matters a lot more where in the rig I'm cloning that to. Um, but really, that's just where you kind of have to get creative with playback and practice, like I was saying earlier, practicing maybe mastering parts of your rig down or, um, you know, doubling or tripling up on certain fixtures and just kind of seeing what works. and. And it's, it's a lot easier to see your programming be more efficient if you do take those broader strokes. And the next question is asking what software you use to program? I program MA2. So I have a Windows machine and I have Grand MA2 on PC software. Uh, it's free. Uh, the, the MA3D software is also free. Just have to make sure that you download the same software version and you can link the two together. So I Thankfully, have a console sitting in front of me, but I don't always have a console sitting in front of me. So the free on PC software program is really nice. Um, that way you can you can do everything you can on a console, you just can't output. So just get an get an extra monitor, download the free software, and have fun. Okay. Do you prefer DNX over network or physical daisy chain DNX cabling? Well, I always daisy chain my DNX for at least the package, but if we're talking about controlling. Um, I don't really have a preference. I mean, at festivals, I'm a huge fan of FACN uh, as the protocol. Um, I always have the least amount of issues or no issues with that. Uh, I personally don't care if they hand me dry lines, uh, DMX lines, or a network. Um, but that's good. It's actually a really, really good question to ask, too, because um, I wish I would have squeezed this into the presentation. but I'll do it now. Uh, if you are traveling with the ground package uh, and you are going to be using it at a festival rig, make sure that however you're controlling your ground package is not going to interfere with how you're controlling the festival rig. Or make sure that you can you can find a way to do both. So if you if you only are using uh, straight DMX lines for your ground package, let's say you have two universes, um, make sure the festival rig. Uh, at least has a way if, you know, they're using six lines at front of house and you don't have all the room, make sure that you're able to find an opto or a network split if you're using a network or some way to make sure that you can operate your ground package and your festival package efficiently. Um, it's more common these days to show up to a festival and they're running off of a network. Um, and I always run off of a network for my ground package too, which really just means I, I just get a network switch. and. Things are usually good, but that's a really, really important question to have with your festival before arriving to the festival. 
Okay, what is the fixture type that you would use for your garden? Oh, okay, so my garden is um, actually just a bunch of different fixtures. So uh, this is a really good example. If I do a corporate show, um, hopefully, knock on plastic, I guess, um, <laughs> I have some downtime and I can store a lot of presets for the fixtures in the rig, um, and, you know, and really dial it in. And I, you know, maybe I won't use that fixture again for a long time, but the way I can keep that preset information, all that fixture profile information stored in my console is if I have a copy of that in my file. Um, so if I do, I don't really keep a lot of, um, like, multiple quantities of broadcast lights patched in my show file. My starter show file only has my festival rig patched, um, some bitmaps, and then my garden. So the garden is where I keep patched all the fixture profiles that I don't necessarily need to see in my 3D all the time or like need to have a lot of, uh, you know, need to have multiple fixtures of. But it's a way to store, to keep that fixture patched in my file and to keep that information stored. So if I do come across a rig and I have fixture information in my show file for uh, that profile, I can, uh, I can just use that profile in the patch and that way it's able to reference presets that I've already worked on. I know it's a little bit convoluted. Um, if you have, if, the, if I didn't explain that well, definitely email me and I can send you a better idea. Okay, the next question is asking about um, preset references. In theory, would you need to keep a copy of a fixture in your show if you create and use preset references? Yes, which is pretty much exactly what I just said. Um, so, yes. <laughs> Don't need to repeat myself. <laughs> um, quick question about the fixture garden after deleting the clone festival file. You only leave one fixture of a type to this garden and the presets will work? Yes. Yes, it will. What approach do you take to cloning into a vertically hung festival rig truss versus horizontally hung festival rig truss? Oh man, it's different every time. I feel like doing it, honestly. Um, actually, that happened to me a few months ago um, where it was, thank, thankfully, it was just um, two, two vertical downstage towers with like six beams and then two vertical upstage towers with six beams. Um, so I think for that, I, and they had they had beams uh, in horizontal truss too. I think for that, what ended up working was uh, in the air on the horizontal truss, I cloned my downstage beams to my downstage beams and upstage to upstage. Then I actually swapped it so the vertical towers, I cloned the upstage beams to the downstage ones and the downstage beams to the upstage ones. So there was a little bit of an offset create a little bit more depth. Um, again, that's just another practice with uh, with your show file in different situations. Uh, get prepared to think about those weird trusses. I've had, you know, I recently went to a show where the truss was hung from like the back upstage corners to downstage center. So it was only like this weird angled and then it was also raked a little bit. You kind of, you know, you never know what design you're gonna you're gonna come across, but that's just why practicing adapting your rig is super super important. So maybe offsetting my beams worked for me. It might not work for you in your show. So maybe practice building a couple of vertical towers in there and um, offsetting your cloning, or maybe you want to clone your spots to those beams. You know, you just have to really get creative with it. Okay, the next question is asking, when you patch your touring rig, what universe or SACN starting points do you start with? Say 1 to 10 is touring and 11 to 100 is festival or vice versa. That's exactly what I do, actually. Yeah. I always put my my consistent package, my touring package, just from 1 to whatever. Um, and then usually I skip to the next 10. So let's say I'm using, for some reason, 13 universes in my ground package. I have a lot of pixel tape on this one. Um, then I usually start my festival package or my uh, or or my whatever whatever else at like 21. So I make sure to skip a little bit. Um, I have a universe pool view in my file where I can quickly move universes around, uh, just depending on the day. Um, in my show file, actually, I do have my festival rig patched in the 30s because I've had a lot of rigs recently that are festival rigs that are patched in the 20s. Um, it really depends. Honestly, it's always moving around. I could really just keep it at 100 if I wanted to. That's where I keep my bitmaps, though. Um, 
personal preference. I would just keep your your festival rig, uh, all your patch information, just a farther farther down the line in the universe. In the universe pool. Okay, next question: If you get a festival plot ahead of time, will you do all of your cloning in rough positions and presets ahead of arrival, or do you like to work once you know what's actually happening on site? Um, so it's pretty rare that I update. Actually, I don't think I've ever updated positions ahead of time in 3D. Uh, cloned and then updated positions. Um, I, I like I said, I do come with a festival rig patch and then a, a show file with the festival rig patch, and I come with a version with it patched and cloned. Um, it's only happened to me one time where I've showed up and the cloning was correct because the patch and the fixtures didn't change. Um, so in that situation, all I did was just clone, but I didn't really update anything. Because you might spend the time thinking, it, it might work to your advantage though, if you know you're going to be cloning to a certain fixture where you know that this has to be changed ahead of time for it to work, or you know the strobe function or whatever, and you can kind of put it in ahead of time. Totally up to you, but the problem is that if you do all that work cloning your rig, and then maybe half of them are changed, uh, half the fixtures are changed, or the patch is different or something, it's sometimes easier to just start over than to try to fix all of that. So I just kind of start from there, which honestly, coming with a passion, having to be mostly right is already a super good starting point. Okay, the next question is asking regarding haze and fog. What do you assume or plan for in a festival? Um, well, I always ask, and I always plan for both. Um, I have, well, I also have a, a, some artists I've worked for recently that just don't like it, and it kind of hurts my soul because you need haze to see lights. But, um, <laughs> In my file, uh, I'll just use like a, an MA2 full as an example. Um, I always keep my playback control closer to my screen one, so in the, the right bank of faders. And I always keep uh, my group masters and my haze and fog temps uh, available to me to just kind of ride anytime. So I keep them as temp faders uh, with the intensity information. And that way I can just keep it at a level and if I notice that it's too much, I can bring it down a little bit or off completely. That way I'm not, I, I know some people do buttons where they'll have levels of like zero, 25, 50% haze, 70% haze, whatever. Um, it's just, that's just too many buttons for me to push. I think I'd rather keep my eyes on the show. So if I can just have a fader, I can kind of remember where it is and, and you know move it up and check really quick. That works a little better for me. Um, I always ask for it if they're planning on not having it. I've definitely done festivals where they were like, hey, we weren't planning on bringing haze, this is a problem. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> please bring haze. Um, and at that point, if there is an issue where they're probably not able to bring any atmospheric effects, it might have to come out of uh, the cost to your band that you're traveling with. But that's something that your, your tour manager can work out with the festival. The next question, would you suggest to practice the different scenarios on the computer if you don't have a console? Absolutely. Yeah, um, again, you know, the, the on PC software that I use, um, it does all the same things that a console can do. Uh, just, you know, I, uh, what I suggest is just storing some of your festival rig fixtures in a group, mastering them down, and then playing back some songs and seeing what it would look like with half of those fixtures working. So you can absolutely do the same thing on a computer. How does your universe tool work? Uh, so the universe tool, maybe they heard tool, I say pool. So um, a universe pool in MA software, uh, just like your presets or your groups, it's a pool where you can see your universes. Um, so if, and, and the only reason I keep, I also keep my festival rig patched in the 30s or the 20s is because I have my, my universe pool with my numbers going left to right, right, just like any other, any other preset pool. And I can just see, it, it shows how many universes I'm using uh, and where they are. And you can label them too. So I have, you know, I'll see in the first row, I have maybe my ground package, I'm using six universes. I can see I'm using universes one through six. And then I can see I'm using universes um, 31 through 36, the festival rig or something. So if you have uh, MA2 on PC software, go ahead, clear your screen, go to pools and open up a universe pool and you can see what I'm talking about. The next question is asking, um, well, they say, I like your strategy of programming vipers as your beam fixtures. I'm curious if that ever presents an issue, and if so, what workaround do you suggest? Say you have a rig of hybrids with tons of beams or prism parameters not found in the viper. Ah, 
So this is where my, uh, either if I have the time, I will store them into my songs, or this is where my uh, empty buttons of, of my empty six buttons come into play. Um, because I, that way I can at least store a few different prism presets for the festival rig fixture, have it ready to go in a button so I can have it standing by to, to fire in that fixture when I want to see it in my show. And that way, at least for me, having it just as a toggle or a go or, or something is a lot easier than thinking, oh, I have prism, I want prism in five songs, but I don't have the time to put it in five songs. It's a much easier way to just kind of fire it right then. Okay, we have a final question. What is the best piece of advice you would give to a younger version of yourself? Oof, uh, be honest. Uh, don't be afraid to be more communicative and ask questions. And listen to your designer. Watch your designer. Study the designer. Study the programmer. Um, when I was, and, and I wanted to base this class off of the beginner to intermediate um, uh, time frame because I have only been drawing for three and a half years and all of the mistakes and discoveries that I've made over the years are still very fresh from day one for me. So I wanted to use it as a benefit to you guys who are also probably starting out and learning. Um, but when I first started out, I was just terrified. <laughs> I, uh, my first tour, I was the youngest person on the tour and one of two girls. I was 22. Um, it was scary. You know, I, I was in a situation that I'd never been in before, and I was learning a lot of new stuff every day. Um, I tried to make it seem like I was totally prepared, and that kind of bit me in the butt a couple times where I realized I really needed help. And asking for forgiveness, not permission, is a lot harder. <laughs> uh, so I've just learned to be really communicative, uh, not be afraid to ask questions if I don't know something. I'm always still learning stuff too. Like, I might be teaching a webinar, but I'm learning something new every single day. You're never going to stop learning with this industry. Um, so just keep an open mind. Um, and, all, and, and with that, also remove the idea that if it's, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. You're totally welcome to learn new things. Um, but if you do find something that works for you, don't try to question why it's wrong all the time. Um, and just really pay attention to the people around you. Um, I, I was hired for my first tour from an incredibly talented person, and I was a little bit too afraid to to ask them questions uh, or stand over their shoulder more. And I kind of regret that because I feel like I would have learned a lot more. Um, so just express your interest, be honest, and be kind. Be a good person. Wonderful. Thank you so oh. much, Lauren. We really appreciate thank you presenting you. today. This is great. And yeah, thank um, you so thank much for all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, we can edit those out of the recording. Cool. So, <laughs> <I'm good>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and as a reminder, this was recorded, so we will have this out in a few days to everyone. Um, Lauren does have her contact information up on the screen, so it sounds like she's comfortable with um, you reaching out with additional questions. And just a reminder that we do have more sessions coming up. So if you're interested in attending any of our future sessions, including a second one with Lauren, um, please go to pro.harman.com and register for the other webinars on our calendar. Thanks, everyone, and have a great weekend. Well, thank you, guys. Appreciate Thanks, it. Lauren. Thanks, Laura.